how are you guys doing? Uh, Dr. John here for Extract Talks. Hoping you guys are having a good day. Um, I got uh, Jared here, my right hand man, and we're just kind of talking a little bit about more sustainability topics today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, it seems to be a growing trend. A lot more people. We've been talking about it for a long time, but it seems like it's really starting to pick up with people now. So yeah, definitely want to hammer some more of that information that's going to help people decide what product to buy or right. how they're going to make their products. So. Right, right. Yeah. So um, welcome again. And uh, yeah, every all you guys, we thank you for, you know, commenting on our on our podcast. So we really appreciate that. Um, uh, go ahead and put those comments in there. If you got any uh, any type of questioner, go ahead, put that in there. We, we, we monitor those and yeah. we, we answer them. And yep. so we really like your comments on that. So go ahead and, and, and put that in there. And Definitely. Yeah, yeah, we're always here to help, even if it's something that we're not particularly... You know, if it's off topic, don't be afraid to ask. Yeah, just, just, just go ahead. Also, there's links uh, down in the... You know, down there's always links. We have a you know set of uh, links that for all of our resources and all of our pages there. And in fact, uh, right here are some of our pages. Uh, we got podcasts, podcast tours, or product tours, mini courses, guides, calculators. You can go on there and and kind of look at them and say, okay, well, this is for me. Sign up for those resources, and uh, yeah. and we'll we'll help you get where you need to be in terms of your education, personal education. Uh, we're here. To educate you people, yeah. basically. That's why we do this podcast, yeah. right? So we want the industry to succeed. And yeah. Uh, yeah, we try to put as much stuff out there to make it as easy for people as uh, as possible. Right. So, yeah, whether your thing is podcast, uh, an interactive product tour, the mini courses, I mean, there's something for everybody. So, Yeah, so uh, we're going to talk about more sustainability topics, uh, three key factors for sustainable operations. Yeah, that's what you should. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. What's wrong? Oh. Was it was it squeaking? Okay, leave this in here. By the way, don't 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 edit it out. This is awesome. Okay. Oh, we had a squeaky chair here. Uh, <laughs> all right. Oh oh, there goes the light. Oh, that's good. Oh here, this is a good time for a coffee break. Okay, coffee break, everybody. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot, James. James is the man. Hey, we need to get another microphone so James can join us on this. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. I, think, I think so. I think that'd be a good some, idea. Some mystery science theater 3000. <laughs> uh, he's smoking his pipe over there right now. <laughs> James, stop that. You're making us all hungry. Uh, whatever. <laughs> Knock it off. Oh, man. Yeah. James, he's such a character um <laughs> anyway so oh anyway uh so we're going to talk about three key aspects of sustainability for your operation and you know uh, we, we're kind of operationally focused here at extract yep. lab because we put people into the business and yep. we help them with their operations um so if you're an operator this makes a difference to you because uh you can actually configure your operation to be a horrible, sustainable blight on humankind. <laughs> yes, yes. You can do it. <laughs> Very it, it, easily. You have it within your power. Yes, <laughs> just just yes. go on to YouTube and, you know, <laughs> uh, follow the trends. Okay, follow yep. the trends because those are the things that, you know, really, um, you know, a lot of people are, you know, they just follow, you know, and they don't yeah. really look at it and say, hey, wait, just a second. What about, what about operational cost? What about... You know, they just hazardous see. waste. What about? Uh, oh, it's no big deal. We'll just we'll just throw our waste out. We'll put it in the back of the truck. We'll open up the thing a little bit and then drive around while all the ethanol falls out the back of our truck. I mean, yeah. people actually do that stuff. Oh yeah, it's it's nothing new to the industry. I remember no. years ago, nothing. people yeah. used to just dump leaves, you know, all their trim leaves on the right. road because it was such a hassle to get away from. Get know? away, yeah, get away. And it's like, so, what? I have to pay for this? You right. Know? Oh, you mean I can't I can't put that in a landfill because it has like five or ten percent ethanol in it you mean i can't do that yeah, okay yeah. And, then, and then they're shocked oh how much do you want me to pay to get rid of this <laughs> right. no way i'm gonna burn it i'm Why gonna would I do that when it's just as easy to yeah let yeah. it run on the road or yeah whatever, so so there's some free resources for you and and so um just the question of what what is a sustainable operation right you know and when you um, when you look at and you ask the question, okay, what is it the thing that makes a sustainable operation, and how does that translate into a consumer? Um, you know, these are some of the things that make it make a difference, like optimized engine energy use. Yep. For example, okay, am I going to, um, for example, if I'm going to take a thousand gallons of ethanol and heat it up to boiling point, yeah. boil it off, 
and then cool it back down to minus 40 and do that 50 times a day, <laughs> that's, that is going to be, or even 100 times a day, yep. uh, it, that is going to be a very, a very high energy uh, footprint for you. Yep. Um, optimize waste reuse. Oh. I mean, you know, okay, like, for example, if you can come up with, uh, if you have a waste out of your product, because you're, you, we are talking about natural products here, right? Yeah. So if you can come up with a waste for a natural, natural product and you can go ahead and compost that, why wouldn't you compost it versus having, um, having a material that you can't compost, that Hazardous you can't even, material. yeah, you can't even, you can't, you couldn't feed it to animals, you couldn't feed it. You couldn't even feed it to your kids. <laughs> so, I mean, you could. going to get them to shoot. sleep. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Reduced or eliminated solid chemical waste. Uh, that's uh, this is something similar, but, you know, we we're talking about, you know, getting rid of your chemical waste, both in the chemical process and, and on the solid side. Yep. Um, and then carbon recycling. That's, uh, you know, how you may, for example, uh, emit something, but then if you have the ability to actually plow it back into biomaterials or something like yeah, that, that's where, yeah, that's, yeah. that's where, that's where really, that's what people are looking for. They're looking for reuse, sustainable operations, right? you know, and, um, you know, I think that people just don't have an idea of, you know, really, how if they have a... It? Yeah, right. You so know, they're just not thinking in those terms. And the consumers don't have any idea because they, they, you know, they assume everybody's making stuff in the best way possible. Right. You know, and right, right. realistically, that's usually not how it happens. Right. So. The other thing is reduced VOC and HAP. Now, HAP is called hazardous air pollutants. VOC is uh, volatile organic compounds. Yep. Okay. And um, hazardous air pollutants, you know, they're, they're toxics and stuff. But VOC uh, contributes to smog. Okay. Yep. Ethanol is one of those things that contributes to smog. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's kind of not good for the environment. No. And guess what? If you lose 10% to your solid waste and then you stick that outside and let it out gas yep. for whatever, all that VOC is going into the air, which is typically, how and it's, it's contributing to smog. Yep. Okay. A lot of, uh, Maybe there's a lot of uh, ethanol producers in, in the L.A. area. I don't know. Oh, Maybe there are. Possibly Maybe. contributing to all that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. It does. It absolutely does. Yep. So some of the things that you need to think about with uh, sustainable operations, and uh, this has kind of got the, uh, you know, eyeballs of, um, you know, people who are investors now. Right. Well, again, that's why would they invest into something that's going to potentially, whether it's a fee that they're going to have to pay to the government because of how much energy is being wasted right. or what they're doing to the environment or right. the operational costs. Again, right, exactly. Some people just don't understand that there's a significant difference. And yeah. that's what we're trying to help people understand. Yeah, so these, these, these guys, this is an article that came out of MJ Biz Finance uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, and they were yeah. talking about ESG policies. And a lot of people don't, don't know what that is. It's the first time that they heard about it. Right. Um, so that's an environmentally, environmental uh, sustainability governance policies. Right. So in other words, how, how do you govern your company according to ESG? Yep. And, um, you know, a lot of people are using that for their investment criteria. Okay. Um, and um, like, for example, the S&P 500, they have, you know, companies that are out there that are ranking companies on how environmentally Based, sound right. they are. Yep. So, okay, uh, if you're going to be a big polluter, um, you know, if you're going to uh, have lots of VOC, if you're going to have a high carbon footprint with all your products and all that stuff, we'll... You're, we're just not, not we're just not going to give you we're not going to invest in we're it. not going to invest yeah. in it right so yeah, yeah so um this mj biz thing uh it you know it's it's all about um investing trends and and one of the things that they noted there was right at the that third point there um the esg investing trends has driven the idea of sustainable investing from a nice to have to a need to have yeah i think okay. we're just kind of getting to that point in globally right where, where it's not uh it's not, how do I want to say this? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess they put it pretty well. Nice to have, but a need, need to have. Like right. it's something hey, you got to do it. You got to yeah, do this. Yeah, I'm, this is important or whatever. Um, how to measure it remains a challenge. And that is why we are here. Yes. Because <laughs> we got the calculations. The calculation we got, things. yeah, we got the calculators. Uh, we got all the calculators. We, oh, what do you want to calculate? We can calculate it. What do you got? We will calculate whatever. We'll figure it out. You just tell us what. We'll put the, uh, we'll put some ad think, advanced calculation yeah. on there. But this, this presentation really aims to answer the question of how to measure. Now, okay, uh, 
we, we have already gone over through some of the uh, consumer aspects of this kind of yeah. really high level. Yeah. And what we wanted to do in this presentation really was to, you know, kind of bring it down to, um, you know, the, the calculation level. So right. this is, we're going to keep it, uh, keep it nice and nice and uh, have a lot of levity here, but, <laughs> yeah. but it's going to get a little bit, it's going to get hot. It's going <laughs> to get, like it's going to get hot and boring. Okay. Oh no. We'll oh keep, no. We we'll don't. Keep it uh, spicy. Okay. We're going to keep it spicy. Oh, more bar graphs. Okay. <laughs> oh my word. So here we got, while business fundamentals will absolutely and should continue to be critical uh, factors in investments, uh, their models are adapting to include sustainability and social equity. Okay. Um, Social equity is a part of the ESG, uh, okay. environmental sustainability, yeah. um, but I, I don't know how it really factors in. We, we don't deal with that, at the, you know, with our calculations, but because yep. we're kind of really operationally focused, but it, it right. is important aspect of it. So, and we, we talked about this before, and but it, it is a huge deal. Okay, um, you know, okay, so. You have one gram pen. <laughs> the one gram vape cartridge. One gram vape cartridge. And 99.9% .9 of the people do not know what the, the environmental footprint that that one gram really costs the environment, right? They, right. They, they no, just I have, don't know. Absolutely. You just see a vape cartridge, you buy it. Again, like we said, assume it was ethically made and, you know, the environment was taken right. into consideration. But... You may buy a vape pen because it's two dollars less than the one that's you know exactly. that, that may be it, or maybe it's three dollars less, but you right. you know something along those lines. Yeah, but you know, look at the difference here between uh, the amount of uh, CO two that's generated from an ethanol extraction operation versus a CO two extraction operation. It's not even on the same planet. <laughs> no, no, it's orders of magnitude greater. I, and I'm surprised looking at this, I'm surprised it's not regulated out of existence at this point. Yeah. I mean, it, it really does blow my mind. But yeah, just looking at these numbers, it's it's significant. Well, you know, a lot of uh, people in other industries who use, you know, solvents and stuff like that to, to do extractions, right? Yep. I mean, they're using solvents, okay? They have all the same issues that this industry has. Yeah. We haven't gone, come under scrutiny, really, uh, you know, in a big way because right, right. our industry still is is growing. It's, growing it's still pretty small right so yep. um but you know you're looking at like the soy industry they use hexane to you know that's a huge 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 issue because right. you hexane residuals Ugh. um hexane you know hexane residuals okay it's okay if there's five thousand parts per million in your <laughs> in your stuff and then you keep on eating it and it's a it's a class two right so it's yep. only 500 parts per million is allowed so we know it's toxic the thing right. about it is that they, they thought originally it was class three which so, makes it a little bit safer. Yeah, which makes it a little bit safer because they don't. <laughs> that maybe they just don't know as much as they ought to. So, yep. But the funny thing is that they move it from class three to class two, you know, because right. they found out. Oh well, hey, but, you know. So what about all the people who were eating or using the products before Beforehand. the time? Yeah. Yes. What about that? And they're like, oh, geez, I got cancer today. Or hey, I have this. And they're like, oh, there's no correlation at all. No problem at all. Right. But they don't know because they haven't studied it. That's why exactly. it's on the list. Yep. That's yeah. why it's on the list. Yeah. Okay, so what does that have to do with ethanol? Well, uh, ethanol oftentimes is used with denaturants and things like that. So yes. every, time I'm, every time I get a chance, I'm going <laughs> to dig it, you <laughs> know, but those whatever. those denatured guys. Yeah. So uh, if you want to use perfectly pure ethanol, by all means, we are big fans of that. Absolutely. You know, it doesn't mean that your sustainability score is going to drop to zero because <laughs> I, I'm a big fan of that. No. It also no. doesn't mean that your operational cost is going to drop to zero, but, you know, whatever, so... Yeah. Anyway, so this 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 plot is pretty interesting. Got a lot of like, look at that five percent loss of ethanol to biomass and dewax, uh, fifteen hundred cycles per month. These yeah. are all and pretty as, normal. As you the more you use it, you can see that it's continuously going up. It's not like right. you hit a plateau and okay, this is as high as it gets. No, no. the more you do it the worse for the environment right, right. it is. So, so we're going to go into the factors of what contributes to that huge uptick. Okay, we're going to go through some of the um, energy usage. We're going to go through some of the the different cycles and, uh, you know, also solvent reuse and yeah. how it's manifested as hazardous waste afterward. Right. Okay, right. for, 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 um, for people who are under regulation. Yes. There's a lot of people who just are not under regulation. They don't That's care. That's true. They're That's literally true. going to go and take the hazardous waste and, you know. Reuse it again. Or they're just going to keep on using it, and it gets really janky. 
Um, there are a bunch of different uh, extraction solvent types. Obviously, there's water, butane, CO2, ethanol, and perfluorinated fluids. By the way, the last one, perfluorinated fluids, bad idea. Mostly because you can't measure the residuals. Okay. Because they're uh, they have residuals in them. Obviously, there's always residuals. So I've never actually heard that. What what are prefluorinated fluids? Per, oh, okay. Like some people want to use like refrigerants oh, to extract. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. Or they'll want to use a perfluorinated refrigerant to extract. Now it works. Yeah. Right. Right. And they're like, oh well, look at this. We measured it, and it doesn't have any. It's it's ultra pure. But yeah. but you have to realize that. Uh, you you can't actually measure the perfluorinated fluids, uh, you know, residuals very oh, well. Really? They need to be in there. You can't measure them. Yeah. They're not under normal methods. People don't, <laughs> because they don't show up under uh, UV detector or okay. they don't, you know, you have to have a mass spectrometric detector typically and you have to have very, very specific ways and you have to have a laboratory that's actually qualified to measure those those <laughs> fluids specific. specifically because yeah. they stick to plastic, okay? okay? So you may have them in there, but then you, you're working it up, and they'll stick to the plastic, so and you don't know. You think you don't have any. Not accurate reading. Yeah. Right, right, accurate reading, yeah. Okay. So obviously right. there's ethanol. We know about that. Obviously there's CO2. We know about that. We I'm not going to talk about butane or water, um, um, but there, there are pros and cons to all of these different ways of doing it, you know? So, yeah. but we're going to focus right now on ethanol and then we'll kind of, uh, kind of compare and contrast that to, to CO2. So ethanol is a, a, a key to extraction technique. It's been used all over the world. Um, you know, the most popular pro- at this time. I yeah, mean. I would say there's, there's a trend there. Like for example, in Canada, I mean, everybody originally was CO2 and then there, the kind of the West coast trend came up and, People start saying, oh, well, hey, let's do ethanol. Okay, yeah. now now they're finding out in Canada that it's too costly, it's yeah. too environmentally unsound, whatever. And so they're now swinging back to CO2 <laughs> yeah. because they didn't understand what the hidden costs were. Right. They didn't understand what the hidden sustainability factors were. So um, there's there's definitely a swing back along those lines. Um, but, you know, this a lot of it goes over some of the things yeah. of what drew them to. Yeah, ethanol. right. Cheap equipment is relatively available. Yeah. Um, denatured ethanol is cheap and plentiful. And then it's low tech and it's easy to use. So yeah. those are some of the things that are, you know, kind of draw people to do it. And I got a little graph there. Certainly there lots of people who, you know, you can see the trends over time right here. This is a global volume of 700. Just just looking at the keyword ethanol extraction, you can see it's kind of you know spiking up. You know, yep. people are looking for it in the United States. Uh, people in the U.S. Um, they really, you know, they we don't operate. have the benefit of Health Canada coming in there and saying, <laughs> "Hey, you know, Something's you can't just use that forever." Right, right. right. And we're, we're really relying on state by state regulators who just don't have. Uh, they don't have they the, don't the basis, it. the yeah. basics on that. So, yep. Yep. So that's something that's something that, um, you know, that's what we're here to do is educate. Right. Exactly. So, okay. Um, one thing is clear about ethanol extraction is that you need a lot of ethanol. Yes. <laughs> okay. that's, that, that's just it. So yep. no well, typically what that. you have to do is you, you have like a pound of it, right. And you have to, you have to fluidize it, right? Soak it. Yeah, you have to soak it and yeah. then and then make it so you can actually because it, it's like a sponge, right? Because right. it'll be dry at first, or you know, five percent water or six percent water's in there. Yep. And then they it sponges it up. Yeah, yeah. The, the biomass sucks up the ethanol, and you're not using a vice to squeeze all that ethanol out, so you're losing a considerable amount. Yeah, yeah. And and also it's it's sucking it up because it is like a sponge; it gets intercalated in there. So yep. the rule of thumb is one gallon of ethanol per pound of biomass. Yep. Okay, so so, depend, what if, so 500 pound a day operation, 500 gallons of ethanol. Well, yeah, you probably need at least a thousand because you, you know you're recycling all the time. Yep. So you need to have enough there. Excess where, on hand. Yeah, well. you have to have excess on hand. Okay, um, you know. So um, also reuse operations may be able to keep up with ethanol extraction to reduce the amount of ethanol needed in a facility. So that, that's where you try to reproof it or you yep. try to Recycle bring it back to its original state, right? Yep. Yep. And the FDA has guidelines for solvent reuse. So you can't this just do it 50 forever. times. Yeah, forever, yeah. exactly. There are, th- there are basically four or five th- different things. First of all, you must uh, establish the maximum amount of times that you can reuse that ethanol. Okay. Okay. And you do that with a uh, validation of that, hey, look, I'm bringing it back to its original state, yeah. right? Um, the issue with that is obviously there's lots of co-distillates that come across. So you're always going to have something in there. And you don't really know what it is, right? All right, all right. Um, Those unknowns that you like chasing down. Yeah, the unknowns and things like that. Um, the counter to that is, hey, well, the unknowns are in the original extract anyway, so it doesn't really matter. 
Um, yeah, I think I think mm-hmm. maybe um, mm-hmm. if, if it was if it was like an uh, you know maybe if you didn't have a known you know in in uh, in the extract and you had an unknown in the in the solvent you know yeah you, you wouldn't want to you know continuously re no. use that <laughs> onto new batches because you don't really know what you're contaminating yeah, you're it with. You're essentially putting small amounts of that right. into your extract. Well, we don't know, so we can use it again. No, right, that's exactly. that's kind of like what the FDA does. Okay, yeah, yeah okay. We don't know, so you can go ahead so and eat it. Must it. Be a, yeah, yeah. It must must be okay, right. you don't know. We don't know, so you can have five thousand ppm. <laughs> at, you know, for whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So anyway. That's that's the two things, and then the uh, you have to have you have to establish a maximum number of times. You have to validate. Um, then you have to make sure you have a good testing program for for that. You and know, so that's it. per company. That's again not something that each state sets, or how does that? Well, the FDA has set these guidelines up for solvent reuse, and you know, whatever. They, as long as they fall within those. Yeah, as long as they as long as they show. Oh, the other last thing. Yeah, as long as they show that hey, this is okay. Yeah. You know, whatever. Okay, I remember the last thing. It was like a risk assessment. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, that's where really where you are um, looking at, you know, the risks associated with the contaminants. You're looking at the risks associated with um, the reusing the solvent. Yep. And, and the whole point of the risk assessment is to say, um, you know, oh, here's why it's okay. Right. Or here's why here's, well, here's why, why we don't think not. that that here's why it's not right. Yeah, yep. so that's all judgment calls, you know. And there's right. always ways to get around regulation, you know. <laughs> yes, I can yes. move my, uh, you know, I can move my operation to some place that doesn't have any regulation. Right, right, and then just ship, the, sell, back and ship the stuff back and yeah. whatever. So anyway, don't uh, do that though. Ethanol extraction needs a lot of ethanol, and it also produces a true. When you use that ethanol, it, there's a lot of BTUs that are needed to make that ethanol yeah right so it's 131,000 BTUs per gallon of ethanol oh, so you use a thousand like you're, you're using a lot and then you're reusing it because right. you're changing and then you're changing, changing your batches out. out and then you're heating it up and cooling and yeah. heating it up and cooling it with a huge swing okay so it all, adds up. it all really does add up so here's the greenhouse gas emissions from uh producing ethanols are huge okay so let me see here this is like the ethanol itself that you use, okay? And here's the gallons that are used, 30, 55, 2,000, for, to process 2,000 pounds of hemp. This is the BTUs that are required to produce that many gallons of ethanol. Ugh. And these are the pounds of CO2 emitted from that ethanol production itself, 472. And you can see as wow. you start to use a lot of it, that's where it really starts to get really large, yep. you know? So that's a 31,440 for 2,000 gallons of hemp. That's for 2,000 pounds of hemp. Oh, my gosh. Right? That, that's yeah. a lot. That's an astronomical amount. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this oh, is uh, the conversions to the greenhouse gas really were taken from this, uh, this EIA.gov, which estimates that 120 pounds of CO2 are emitted per million BTUs. So that's where I got that. And then every pound of hemp uh, processed with ethanol has a GHG deficit right from the very beginning. There's just no getting around that. There's no getting around that. So you're you're basically, you buy ethanol, you are... You're contributing to the problem, right? You're contributing right off the bat, yeah. And then then you're trying to basically get the ethanol in, you're using it in your operation, and... um, you know, it's like okay, now you're now you're what you're doing is you're trying to you're trying to cool it down so that you can get the right and you're cooling it down sometimes at minus forty, oh, yeah. sometimes at minus twenty, sometimes even lower, yeah, right? So yeah. Okay, so you got that, and then and then you are after you get that out, then you're heating it up to evaporate it all exactly. off to its boiling point, <laughs> and there's this little thing called the heat of vaporization, which is uh, really. It's a very, uh, that's the main energy component to actually, you know, heating something up. It's, it's actually vaporizing it. Okay. You know, it takes a lot of work to vaporize it because ethanol likes itself. It's going to stick there. <laughs> yep. And then, so you have to add a lot of energy to make it d- go in from a liquid into a gas. That's right. the heat of vaporization. So yep. that's the big deal. So, um, so for every 2,000 pounds of hemp processed with ethanol, approximately 6,232 kilowatt hours needed for heating and cooling. Man. Isn't that crazy? One ton, yeah. That's what just taking the that, cycles right here, and that's and really that's, what I got here for the that's kind of the, showing here. Again, just the electrical energy being used yeah. to, to process right. that. We're not even talking about the environment quite yet. Right, right, exactly. But but what I did was I took that 6,232, oh, yep. and I converted it over to a CO2, pounds of CO2 emissions. So you did bring using it to this environmental EIA gov. Yeah, yep. right there. So that they, they told us what to do, how to do the calculation. 
So 57, 33 pounds of CO2 just by heating and cooling for 2,000 pounds. That's just insane. Again, so I got 31,000. Now I got to add, you know, 6,000 to that, right? People don't take this. I don't think they take this into account. Usually, no. again, it's just how much, you, how much energy does it require to run the machine? Right. You know, but they're Look, not looking at it. It's that. also really costly. Look at that in terms of Ooh. the daily cost, right? Look at that, 1,000 1, chill it. Because you're going, it's basically, it's 153 degree Fahrenheit change. Yeah. You're going from, uh, you're going from boiling point down to minus 40. Yep. Yep. It's not going to do it by itself. No, it's not going to, you have to chill it. You (laughs) have to chill it. So, and and the bigger your operation, the more pounds you do, Mm -hmm. the more it's going to cost, the more environmentally unsound it is, the more whatever. So, um, so that's the energetics of heating and cooling contribution to the overall, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. And then the VOC pollutant emissions from unrecovered ethanol. So now I have a, uh, I have a, a pound of ethanol, yep. and I've, I've put it through my salad spinner, and it's got five five percent ethanol left into it. You know, yep. um, a lot of the top producers who do a lot of ethanol extractions, they they give me the range of ten to five to ten percent loss of ethanol. So we're just giving it the best best. We'll give you guys a benefit benefit of the, of the doubt. Yeah, five five percent loss is is probably good. You can model it with um you know a, a, like a one percent loss or whatever but that five percent is kind of like it's kind of what's out there you that's know a I mean? standard that's yeah, pretty that's, much again given and if you go to any you know any company out there they may you know they'll they'll, they'll give you that range i right. think yeah yeah so okay so for every two thousand pounds of hemp processed with ethanol it's the equivalent of five thousand seven hundred and thirty three pounds of emissions and this is how we calculated Damn. that so what you got five you got five percent and you got a certain amount of ethanol that you're losing you got a certain number of cycles there's a cycles that are basically you're losing per cycle and there's the cost of the losses per cycle that's the cost of the ethanol this is for two thousand pounds wow. with this thirty gallon but you you know two hundred and forty six gallons will be left in the in the biomass and will eventually evaporate so um, what happened there oh. There it is. There it is. Yeah, okay. that's so just, and that's, so money that's, that that's VOC, right? So yep. you put that outside. Okay, first mm-hmm. of all, you, you okay? So a lot of people, a lot of people want to want to take that five percent, yep. uh, ethanol biomass, and they want to put it into the landfills. Right, right. That, that's the first thing. Well, yeah, they just want to get rid of it. It's, it's, it. waste. it's waste. It's right. waste at this point. Right, yeah. So what are you, you going to do? Okay, well, some people look at they look at it and, oh, it's got protein in it and stuff like that. Maybe I want to sell that. So. Right. Well, yeah, if you were in an industry that allowed you to do hemp feed and things like that yep. for animals, it'd be really great. But guess what? It's got ethanol in there. You can't you can't actually sell that stuff no. to, to, because it's got ethanol in it. They're going to test it, and USDA is going to say, no, no, no way. Exactly. Okay, exactly. so. so you um, just lost out on more money. You just lost stream. out on more money. You had lost a possible waste stream. But at the same time, um, that's not really available to hemp processors right now. But it, it could right. be in the future. Oh, yeah. They've been um, talking about it. Yeah, they've been talking about it. So, But even two of, okay, so you volatilize 246 gallons, uh, volatilize it, and then convert it to CO2. Yep. Um, you know, so that's where I got that 5,733 pounds, okay? Because really it's, it's converting to CO2. The issue, with, the issue with ethanol is that the smog. Right. That's the issue with that. Yeah, everything that it's putting in the air. So, again, as it's evaporating, it's still there even though you can't see it. And it's turning into smog, which is, yeah, hazardous for the environment. Yeah, so... So, there's a solvent loss to biomass. Um, Yeah, I think we talked about that. Um, Let me see here. This is a quotation from a guy, U.S. Attorney Randy Grossman. Oh, right. Okay, crimes against the environment are crimes against all of us. You know, you, you might... You might have, yeah, because you're living in the environment. It's, you know. Yeah, all yeah. of us live here. So yeah, I mean, right. For one, you know. We will not allow our communities to be dumping grounds for harmful chemicals because companies refuse to follow the rules. So there's talking about a processing firm there who, who had hazardous waste violations. Okay. Um, this is one example of many hundreds of examples, and there's lots of people who don't get caught. So yeah, oh yeah. hazardous waste violations, you know, the deal with hazardous waste is, um, so after you use all that ethanol, use it again and again and again and again. Okay. And then at some point in time, it's going to get janky, unusable, Unus- well, basically unusable beyond, you know, so what do you do with that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> drive around, uh, <laughs> drive around some country roads with the uh, glug glug glug. Pour yeah. it down the drain. No, no. You okay. put it in a big. You put it in a big 
blue barrel like that and you call safety clean and they will manifest it for um, a certain amount of dollars. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, when they manifest that waste, so typically they'll put it into an incinerator. So they just burn it. They burn it. Okay. <laughs> I could have done that at home. Yeah, I could have done that at home. <laughs> no, Absolutely. You could have no, done that at home. Don't do that. But at a home. lot of, you know, some of these places are advanced and they actually convert it into energy, which is pretty oh, good, cool, which is right. pretty cool. Um, but uh, a lot of them are not, in fact. Right. And so because there, a lot of the incineration, uh, you know, think there's that's that's kind of a high that's a technology that they you know don't really have yeah so um a lot of it is just just burnt up so i I don't really have an estimate somebody knows what that estimate is of you know what incineration is done you know what do you do with it whatever um but yeah that's it that's it so you got uh basically incineration so if you have let's just say you have two thousand pounds and you do two thousand pounds a day or something like that of hemp Yep. And then you keep on doing that. And let's say at the end of the month, the, the stuff is really smelling not so good. <laughs> yep. It's looking really bad. And you're like, hey, not you clear know, anymore. Gotta, yeah. No. And, and, and your process has told you you have to throw it away versus continuing to use it. Okay. Yep. Then you put it in the barrels, you call Safety Clean, and then you pay them to get rid of it. And then they incinerate it. And all that goes up as CO2. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not only throwing money away, you're, you're adding to the, the greenhouse uh, gas. Right. 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 Ethanol is considered a VOC because it contributes to ozone, smog forming formation. Ugh, I Bam. like the picture of California. There. Yeah, that well, yeah, of, yeah, that was a I, stock photo from Microsoft. <laughs> no, no, I, but <laughs> when you like, think of smog, I mean, that's where most people think of is, you know, big, yeah. big cities not being able to see very well. Right, and, yeah. And again, I, I don't think people understand how bad that stuff is. Right, you right. Know. Denatured ethanol was used, other compounds such like as hexane, IPA, acetone, maybe present considered hazardous air pollutants. So, that's when that's when denatured people have to really think about okay, uh, am I really you know VOCs there? It's contributing to yep. smog, but then what about HAP? Right? If I have something <laughs> else, which is mm-hmm. something else. For this reason, it's not recommended that the spent and contaminated biomass mass be composted. That makes sense. Yeah. So you absolutely. compost it, then all that stuff's going to go up into the air. Into the air. Yeah. And then what? You know. Well, and then. We're all breathing it in. Yeah, and it's we crime against humanity. <laughs> no, it is. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, soy meal extracted uh, with ethanol must be manifested as hazardous waste. That's some information that I got from a soy producer. So that's kind of interesting. So again, similarly, so, I mean, that's the equivalent of uh, used biomass. Yeah, I mean, technically, exactly. it is used biomass, and it's they, spent waste. Yeah, yeah hazardous so. waste. So anyway, here's the ethanol extraction sustainability pros and cons. Uh, the pros are the lowest starter, co- low, lower startup cost. Yep. Which I, you know, after it makes sense. It's appealing, you know, yeah. when you're trying to build a business. But it, you know, it, it's it's not that much different. No. It's, you're talking about maybe a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars difference. And, right. Right. Um, you know, we, you know, a lot of the pricing really has kind of adjusted. You know, um, you know, kind of in response to the the ethanol crowd, and yep. and so not only is their operating cost a lot less for the co2 but it's also like orders of magnitudes more sustainable right so right low tech that's something that they got i mean it's really low tech you, you put a zipper in the bag much. you throw it in there <laughs> you, you push the button and yeah they did i mean uh they you're not dealing with pressure i mean you're right. still dealing with t- temperatures but the uh i know yeah. the pressures can kind of scare people sometimes yeah so anyway, yeah, things like that. So ethanol has a higher solvent strength. Those are the pros. Uh, the cons are VOC and HAP emissions, crimes against humanity, essentially. <laughs> um, so uh, high energy and greenhouse gases to produce the ethanol itself yep. that you're using, and that all goes into your calculation. High energy and greenhouse gas used to chill and heat ethanol, yep. and then a higher uh, cost of operation, energy losses, reuse, hazardous waste, et cetera, et cetera. So yep. those are the, the, the pros and cons, really, in t- from a sustainability standpoint. So yep. Um, um, you know, in terms of investors, if you're an investor and you are looking at, you know, investing in an ethanol operation, it's really something that you should think about when you're um, when you're assessing your investment. Okay, is the operation that I have is it sustainable? Right. We're giving you the tools here, and you know, quite honestly, nobody Figure else has done this assessment before. No. You know what I mean? No, so they're all just like, okay, well, this is all hidden. You know, kind of yeah. like the hidden cost. Nobody actually yeah. does the math. You got to take time to do the math. Right. Put the Put the you know put it together operational so. costs yeah, yeah I wonder if they costs. I wonder if they just eliminate the uh, the solvent loss over time like how, you know I don't know how an investor would look at what we've just they don't even everybody. look at it they just they just look at they 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 look at their technician what do you say 
and they're like, oh, we're doing this because this is what I did before, and bam, that's how it happens. That's That's how it happens. So um, just to go over some quick things, um, you know, uh, related to CO2, CO2 is a colorless, uh, odorless, inert gas. Of course, it is a uh, GHG itself. Yes. But because your emissions are so low, it is, um, and you're not, you don't have to, you know, create like tons of ethanol. Yes. You don't have to use a lot of ethanol, very little tiny bit of ethanol. You do use it. Um, so, yep. um, you know, those are the things. It's not, there's some interesting things. And there's, a, if you look into the chemical engineering literature and the chemistry literature, um, it's always, um, you know, talked about as a green solvent right. um, for those reasons, you know. Yep. And uh, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, there's whole books written on this from Wiley or, you know, different, different, uh, you know, where they go through all the different calculations. Okay. On this, you can go and look at them and chemical engineers know this fact for a long time. And it's like, <laughs> we're just like, okay, well let's do it because, because it I'm going to save, th- I'm going to save, I think I'm going to save 30 cents a, a cartridge or something like right. that on it. So, so whatever. No, so CO2 more. is a colorless and odorless inert gas. In fact, we're, we are exhaling it right now. It's pretty safe. It's <laughs> used in food processing worldwide. It's a green refrigerant. It's a food packaging preservation. It's fire suppression. It's used for Puts oh, out wow. fires. No, I didn't Puts out fires. Yeah, CO2. It, yeah, right. you, you, it'll, so no, yeah. No worry about the, uh, the lab out there. Exploding right. Or anything That's like true. That, That's so. true. Impurities are ni- nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we don't have to worry about the inert gases and I- ideal noble gases uh, that are the impurities. Wow. Um, and hydrogen must not be exposed to 5,000 ppm for more than 10 hours. So that would be like, okay, in a uh, no oxygen environment. So Okay. That would be like uh, I have been in a five thousand ppm uh, for for like eight hours uh, oh, plus oh. a CO two. Yeah, there was a well. We did an installation one time in Canada. I'll All tell right. you a little bit about this. They, <laughs> yeah, you know, and they they were kind of like they didn't have they didn't have a vented. And, you know, oh. so there was a little bit of CO2 in there and it doesn't take much to fill up the room. And so yeah. I was in there and I would turn off the alarm and continue to work and say, hey, you got to get this vented or you're going to have a problem. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll get so this sucked whatever. out of there. So the, that's kind of the bottom line, guys. Um, we can go back up here to, you know, um, the, the uh, you know, really the, the, the result. We haven't really gone through and showed you the CO2 calculations, but we can yep. do that at a different time. But, yep. uh, but we did a very, very similar um, assessment, uh, heating and cooling, VOC, yep. all that stuff for CO2. And we also added into that winterization because a lot, a lot of people say, well, don't you use ethanol for winterization? Ethanol. Yeah, but you do, you but it's a little tiny it. bit. It's <laughs> yeah. a little tiny bit. Yeah. A fraction of what's yeah. used. During so the that's where you, you do use it for, for winterization, but you can see it's not making a significant contribution to the overall, um, no. you know, overall um, greenhouse gas, uh, you know, that's being emitted every month. Right. So, so that's it. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I mean, we, we, we enjoyed going through it, obviously. Yeah, and always a pleasure. And, um, yeah, so um, we will talk to you guys later. And uh, thanks. Uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button on the YouTube uh, YouTube channel and uh, go on to our resources page, yep. extractlab.com slash resources. We have, we have got oh, all man. kinds of things in there. <laughs> Guides, we got calculators. calculators yeah. I mean, quizzes. You, oh yeah. man. Yeah. Right. Whole courses designed to help you take the industry further and, and up your right. game. So we're going to come up, maybe we come up with a sustainability course or a sustainability yeah. quiz or something like that. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah we're going to see what you guys on the right track. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thanks a lot guys and uh, take care. Thank you much. See ya.